Hi everybody, Steve Farmer back again to bring you a feature game from round 3 from the 2012 Yield Pueblo Open. And this game is Yang vs. Wang. It's Charles Yang playing white at 2094 against Xixing Wang and he's rated 1898. Charles starts out with d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, b5. The Volga or Benko Gambit. And we're going to go through the opening moves pretty quick because it's a very simple opening to understand. It brings up some complicated middle games, but the opening is very easy to understand. And now Bishop to B7. Uh, most often seen as Knight FD7, but okay. Bishop B7 was played here, and it's a rather rare form of the Benko Gambit. Now, I've played the Benko Gambit way, way back in the 70s and 80s when Pal Benko, the namesake of the opening, started to stir up quite a storm playing this, and he came out with a couple pamphlets. I think it was Chess Digest. For those who don't remember those days of chess, uh, back before computers, they used to make handheld flyers and books, uh, small little booklets, and Chess Digest made opening booklets. And there were all sorts of things like this. Now, this has been seen as far back as the 1930s. So, Paul Benko did not invent this. It was originally known as the Volga Gambit. So named after Enrique Cardeza Felipe Duarte Volga. Or maybe it was named after a river. But in any case, it's, it's actually a very simple opening. The idea is that black is given up a pawn to get the open A and B files to create some counterplay. And look, that pawn has afforded black the chance to be completely developed. White is still two tempo away from being completely developed. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, one tempo for sure. He's got to get his C1 bishop into the game. And his rook on A1, really, we can say, is already in the game. And that's one of the downfalls I didn't like about the Benko Gambit is that he doesn't need to develop his queen rook. It's already developed. But here I think that Zizing had really messed up by playing bishop b7, because if I was playing white, I would play bishop f1 right now. Take advantage of the lack of that bishop being on the a6 f1 diagonal. However, Charles decided to play knight to d2. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Queen to d7, queen to b3, knight a4, Knight c4, knight c3, b takes c3, queen c7, and bishop f4. Okay. There are stock moves that we all get used to in openings. And this is pretty much a stock move in most Benko openings. However, in many of those typical lines of the Benko, the knight's already on d7 rather than on f6. So bishop f4 is okay here, but... I thought that since the knight is not on d7, this is what you need to start thinking about. If the knight's not on d7, how does that affect the position? That's the typical square for that knight, and it's doing something there. It's either controlling the e5, or it wants to go to e5. I think the controlling part is the most interesting to me. So that would make me think, what happens if I play e5? And I think that's probably what white should have done here. Let's delve into that a bit. Let's take a look at e5. First of all, let's look at d takes e5. I think this just runs into some serious trouble for him after d6, hitting the queen, the pawn takes, and then queen takes b7. I think white's winning this. So d takes e5 is bad. But knight takes d5 is probably the idea. Now knight's d2, looking at this attack on the knight here and after e6 now we play e takes d6 and some complications arise for black here nothing too grave mind you but white's going to be able to get all those pieces in play with relative ease so for example if queen takes d6 queen takes b7 knight takes c3 and now queen to b3 and yeah it's a, a bit complicated a little tricky because there's pieces hanging all over the place. Uh, the bishop on g2 is hitting the rook on a8. But the knight on c3 can pop into e2. And then the rook on a1 is hanging. 
So some really, really crazy wild stuff. Uh, unclear is the best I could give this. Maybe I, I would prefer white. I don't know. I, I feel best in saying it's unclear. So queen takes d6 is a viable idea, leading the complicated play. Queen to d7. Mm, seems a little passive, but let's take a look at it. Knight e4. C4. Queen takes c4. Rook fc8. Queen b3. Bishop a6. The bishop returns to the square it was supposed to be on anyhow. Bishop h6 is a nice move. Because if he plays bishop takes bishop, we go queen takes d5. And if pawn takes queen, then knight f6 is going to get the queen back on d7. With a better position for white. So, bishop c4. Hey, doesn't that stop that plan entirely? No, we go queen to d1. And again, the idea is if bishop takes h6, queen takes, bishop takes knight f6, king g7, knight takes d7. And here I think that white is probably a bit better. Not a lot. He's two pawns up. Black's got the bishop pair and really good open file control. So he's got some compensation, but I still would prefer to suffer through this with white if you can call it suffering. All right, so in this line, instead of taking on h6, you can drop the bishop back, and then queen f3. I think white's just a tiny bit better here as well. And then finally, in this position, you can try queen to a5, rook to b1, bishop takes c3, queen takes b7, bishop takes d2, bishop takes, queen takes. Now rook b to d1. So that after queen takes a2, we can throw in d7. And very wild play in this line as well. I like white again, because that pawn on d7 is just so far advanced. Uh, black is up pawn, but white's got tremendous play here. So the, I think the most testing line here is actually the queen takes d6. Now I think this move, e5, needs to be tested further. I think we just took a scratch at the surface there. I may be missing something. But in the game, Charles played bishop f4 instead. Uh, but like I said, when you see a piece out of place in an opening, you got to wonder to yourself, why is that piece usually on d7 here? And it involves the e5 square. So it's a logical chain of thought there. All right, so bishop f4 and knight to d7, a4, bishop a6, and see, the bishop returns, after all. Bishop f1, rook fb8, queen c2, knight to b6. Knight takes b6, rook takes b6, and now bishop to b5. Here, I think it was better, actually, to play rook eb1. And if you trade off a set of rooks, I think that helps white's cause. So if rook takes, rook takes, bishop takes f1, king takes. Now, if he tries queen to a7 to overpower that pawn and win it, it just doesn't quite work. And this is very typical of the mechanics of the A-pawn in the Banco Gambit. And I've seen this in other situations. So I'm sure it'll pop up again in the future. So it's worth remembering. So we're at the B5. How can white get away with a move like this? Well, if queen takes A4, this is just a horrible mistake. So queen takes, rook takes, rook checks, bishop drops down, and bishop H6. And we're going to have mate in the next move for white. So, yeah, there's tactical reasons that white can often get away with this, this kind of maneuver. Rook to b5. And now black should make left, but in doing so, gives white time to advance that pawn. a5. Queen c7, just to carry it on a bit. Uh, it's tough for white here to protect c and a pawn. So it's best to look for counterplay. You're going to give up your pawn advantage, so you might as well try and get something for it. So after rook takes a5, rook checks, king a8, 7, rook to b7, queen d8, king g2, and bishop f6, and I think plays pretty level here. But white has gotten out of all of his troubles. His opening troubles are over. He's working on the middle game ideas. Actually, he's working on end game ideas now. All right, so... We were just looking here at rook e to b1, but in the game, Charles played bishop b5, which seems to be a fine move as well. Bishop takes bishop, pawn takes, rook takes a1, rook takes a1, rook takes b5. Rook checks on a8, rook to b8. 
and I think it's just best to fess up and say it's a draw. Rook takes, queen takes, king to g2 with a dead level game. But he tries to keep on fighting with queen a4. Now, it's move 26. And given that we have a very, call it theoretical opening, a very memorized opening, I would find it very hard to believe that black got into time pressure and missed this because of that. And I think he just didn't understand the position well, didn't calculate this out. And I think he was just too scared to play bishop takes c3. But I think that's the move he should play. He played h5. But let's take a look at bishop takes c3. Well, we hit the queen. Goes back, protects the pawn. We hit the pawn. He can play f6. Bishop moves away and king to f7. Black's up a pawn. I think black is just clearly better here. Winning, uh, he's a bit away from winning. But he's got very good winning chances. Let's put it that way. But after queen a4, he played h5, and things are back to level again. Rook a7, queen to d8, rook to d7, queen to e8, and now queen to a7. Now white's pressing really hard. You know, he's trying everything again, but I'm wondering if he doesn't realize how bad his position really is. Again, black refrained from taking on c3, but I think he should have. In this case, it's a tactical reason why this comes out all right for him. He played bishop f6 in the game. But let's step back. What about bishop takes c3? Well, hell, doesn't that just give up the e-pawn with uh, an attack on the queen? Yes, it does. But let's flip the board. You're playing black. What do you play to win the game? Black to play and win. Rook takes e7 is a bad mistake. Well, hopefully you found the move rook to b1 check. This is a very simple pattern, or a very common pattern, I should say. King to g2, now queen to b5. And now, he's got a couple choices. If it goes king to f3, we go queen to d3, bishop to e3, queen to d1 check. Now, if king to f4, queen to g4 is mate, so king to g2, queen to f1 check, king f3, and now bishop to f3, and I don't know what white can do here. The immediate threat is queen to h1 check, and then queen to d1 mate. I just don't see how white gets out of it without giving up material. And going back here, let's say he tries this. I mean, he can sack the material, and if he goes after the pawn, and we get this kind of stuff going on now, king to e2, queen to d1. Now bishop checks here, now check, and mate. And if king to e3, now bishop d4, king to d3, queen d1, and then mate this way. So yeah, after queen to b5, I really do not see a way to save the game for white. All right, let's go back to our game, and we'll flip the board. But Zizing didn't see that, and he played bishop f6, defending that pawn. And now king to g2. Now the white king is safe. And taking on c3 is no longer an option. Rook a8. Queen b7. Rook b8. Queen c6. Now the pressure is off the e7 pawn. Should the c3 pawn have been taken at this point? Yeah, I think so. He didn't. He played rook to c8 here. Let's pop back for a moment and see what happens if he takes the pawn. I just think that this works. Because anytime white plays bishop g5, black is free to play f6. Bishop e3, and now rook to d8. Yeah, we got to trade off that rook if possible. Rook a7. Okay, we can trade off the queens at least. Now rook to c8. Rook takes e7, rook takes c6. Rook d7, rook to a6. I don't know that black has enough to win the game from here, but he's certainly not in any danger of losing the game. Let's at least let's take that with some kind of gratitude. He's got a pass C pawn, so the ball's in his court to try and win the game. But back to the actual game, he played rook to C8. Now rook to C7. Queen takes queen. Rook takes. Now he can't take the rook because the pawn just walks in, so rook to A8. Now E5. Nicely done by Charles. This is the only way to play if you are going to attempt to win the game. Now best here is to take with a bishop. He did not. But let's take a look at that. And bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes c5, and now e4. 
I think Black has some chances to survive in this game. In the game he played d takes e5. Bishop to e3, king f8. I think rook takes c5 is a good move in the game though Charles played bishop takes. King e8, now c4, king d7, king to f3, bishop g5, king to e4. Now f6 is a bit of an inaccuracy. I think it would be better to play rook to a4. And why is this? Well, if the white king goes back to the third rank, he's not protecting that d-pawn anymore, so he's not going to be able to push the c-pawn at any point. What happens if white takes on e5? Well, the pawn on c4 is hanging. So, yeah, this is a little nuance that black just overlooked. But you know what? It is time control move. And I'm sure that he just wanted to make a move so that he got the extra time and he played f6. It looks harmless enough, right? It's not harmless at all, unfortunately, for black. It leaves a hole on e6, which is pretty bad. Uh, king to d3 was played. Bishop to c1, and now rook to e6. All right. End games are won by creating two weaknesses and then hitting on them where your opponent cannot possibly cover both weaknesses. Now, one weakness that black has is that white has a pass c-pawn. The other weakness that black has is that white's attacking his e-pawn. And that can only be defended in one way. Now, the proximity of the king to the c-pawn and the e-pawn make it a difficult win, but it should be a win, or very good chances to win at least. So he protects the pawn, now bishop b4, bishop b2, c5, and now bishop to d4. Had he tried rook to c8, we can go c6 check, king c7, rook takes e7. It's pretty cut and dry that white's going to win this. So bishop d4 was played, c6, king to d8, and now bishop to a5 check was played, and this is the most accurate way to close things out. But if you wanted to rush in with the pawn move, you could have. It would have worked. So after bishop b6, d7, rook g8, bishop takes e7, king c7, bishop takes f6, rook f8, bishop takes e5 check, rook f6, bishop c5, rook takes f8, bishop takes, bishop c3, bishop d6, bishop f6, bishop e7, take, take, h4, and white's winning. But the move played in the game, bishop a5, is just cold-blooded and accurate. King to c8, and now d6, taking advantage of the fact that the pawn on e7 is pinned. Black resigned at this point. A tough loss for the young man. The Benko Gambit is a very mechanical opening. I don't think it's very complex. I don't think it's hard to memorize. It's not hard to memorize uh, these lines at all, but if you get them out of place, you can get into some trouble. That happened early on for Wang in this game. Uh, bishop to b7 is not the main line. I don't think it's a good line. But then again, it's not yielding a whole lot to the opponent, but remember, you gave up a pawn to get some activity for your pieces. Why would you want to put your bishop on a less active diagonal? All right. Uh, an interesting game, nonetheless. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll tune in on the next game. I'll try and bring that to you as soon as I can, the last from round three. In that game, we're going to be looking at the game of Nick Thompson versus Rajaraman, and that was a good game as well. And Nick's always a favorite of my videos, so look forward to doing that one. All right, folks, that's it for now, and until next time, good luck.